What's the response when we hear again about children being shot in a school? Our response is Passover. On Monday, in a private Christian school, some deranged woman walked in and killed six people, three of them children. It just makes our heart what is going on. Today, across Pennsylvania, all these swatting calls of fake school shootings. It's in the heads of a lot of unhealthy people. She walked in there and 14 minutes later, 14 minutes later is when they killed her. And in 14 minutes, six lives were stopped. And this is the 19th shooting in three months in schools and universities in America. There's so many, and sometimes it's the children themselves. Horrific massacre in Texas last year, 21 people were killed. A first grader shot his teacher in Virginia. There was a shooting last week in Denver. And this is all juxtaposed to Pesach. The Lubavitcher Rebbe said, before most of this started, before we saw this horrific breakdown in the schools, that we need to bring a moment of silence to schools. A moment of silence means a time when children are supposed to pray. Not that we're giving them any words of prayer. We don't want our children being taught not the Christian prayer, not the Catholic prayer. Not No, it's silence. Go home, ask your parents what to think. The concept is to remind them, to reinforce that the world is not a jungle, that there's a God. And the Rebbe said, if children are raised in an atmosphere that life is a jungle, jungle meaning random violence, a jungle meaning the greater the aggressor, the more power, then horrible things happen. And how do we respond to all of this? Again, this happened this week. Our response is Pesach, Passover, Passover, Passover personally, and that our personal Pesach, our personal Passover, should bring the end of Pesach to the world. We want a, a world that shifts. And for that world to shift, we really start by creating that shift inside ourselves. When we change it inside ourselves, we really are able to affect the world. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing power we have that what we do literally trickles down to every person in the world. What does Pesach mean? Passover. What are we passing over? It means freedom from the physical, freedom from the limiting, freedom from the oppression, and freedom that children can walk safely to school and be safely in school and walk safely home from school. We for ourselves, and literally, we can bring it to the world. And Pesach is especially relevant to children. I mean, as we all know, if we are or not focused, but for sure, we know that the Seder is deliberately a child-centered event. We do think specifically to arouse the curiosity of the children, to engage them. The whole kickstart of the discussion of the Seder is four questions that children ask. Now in Chabad, after all, the, each child individually asks the question and then all the adults also ask them because, hey, we're children to God. So we're also asking him these questions. We also got a lot of questions here. But the whole say there is like the answer to the questions of the child because the children are the future. And Pesach is when we became a nation. So it's a time to focus on our nation's future. So Pesach, Passover. And the energy of Pesach is a very valid response to children, Johnny Nashville, or harms anywhere in the world. And at least for this week, I think as we're thinking these thoughts and trying to create inner freedom that should trickle to everybody else in the world, we could really be focused on freedom for children. Children should be safe. Children should be safe to go to school and sit in school and come home from school. Now, I know last year, we really went through the whole say there, there are 15 steps and we did it really fundamentally. So I said, well, I can't do that again. I did that last year. <laughs> so I wanted to focus on the Seder plate. And then I wanted to focus on a little bit on three out of those 15 steps. So I picked three that I just especially resonated for me. And that's why I'm picking them, obviously. And one thought from the Magid, if you want to have the ability, all your children are saying what they learned, you can also share. If it's not an atmosphere conducive to sharing, you can keep it in your own heart and have something to think about when you're reading the words. And also I tried to pick something that 
resonated inside of me and I, I think is very relevant for everyone here. So let's start with the Seder plate. So we have, of course, Seder means order, right? Everything is very ultra ritualized. There is nothing more ritualized in Judaism than the Seder. Everything has significance. Everything has an order. Everything is about achieving personal transcendence, freedom, emotionally, spiritually. And every item that we do and every item on that Seder plate represents a historical event and has a practical application for our own life. It, every item has a soul. It has the meaning. It has the relevance in our personal journey to freedom. The plate, not coincidentally, has 10 items. We have the plate itself. Now, again, you might have a very elaborate silver one. You might use a paper plate, but there's a plate. You cannot just put those matzahs on the table. No, part of the Seder plate is a plate. And then you have three whole matzahs, ideally handmade shmora matzah, three whole matzahs. And then you have some type of covering over them. It might be silver, it might be velvet, it might be cloth, it might be a napkin. But you have some covering over them. And over that, you have six items. Again, Kabbalistically arranged in two, we might view them as upside down triangles. So you've got the one plate, the three matzahs, and the six food items equaling 10, because 10, of course, is like our spiritual DNA. 10 is God's relating to creation to us through his 10 divine attributes called Kabbalistically the spheros or the spherot. And 10 is our soul energy, how we relate outward to ourselves, to others, to God with our 10 soul powers. So 10 is like that basic building block of soul expression and of God expression. And that's why it's 10. On that Seder plate, and again, everything has a precision we're not even going into here. There's a precision of which item you're supposed to put when everything is so, so precise and so, so Kabbalistic. But again, in our two upside down triangles, we have on the top right, the zroya, the roasted shank bone or chicken neck. We have on the top left, the beitza, the cooked egg, and the bottom of that triangle, the base of that triangle, not really the base, but it's upside down, is the mur, the leaves, and the horseradish. If the horseradish isn't too sharp, you can always go for chunks if you're, if you're you know, looking for something sharper. Under that, we have another upside down triangle. We have under the zroya, directly under it, the charoises, right? Our ground fruits, nuts, and a teensy tiny drop of wine. On the other side of that triangle, we have the carpas under the egg, the potato, the onion. And the base of that, we again have maro, we call it a different name, chazeres, but again, the lettuce with the horseradish. It's very precise. It's precise that it's 10. It's precise the two triangles. It's precise where they go. Everything has a lot of power and meaning. And I'm going to speak a very little bit about each one of these items because there's so many things to talk about. Just a little bit so you can hold something in your head. You might be tired by the say there. You might have worked hard. My advice that I give every year is work really hard Saturday night, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So Wednesday, you don't work as hard. Wednesday, you should work the least of all those days. So you can actually come to the say they're ready. The sage is an experience that happens twice annually. If you lived in Israel, it would happen once. And the power of that is, is just that. So it's worth being ready and trying to absorb it to our best ability. So what are we absorbing? What we're absorbing is, is freedom. What we're absorbing is faith because faith is our road to freedom. And the strongest thing of these 10 items and the strongest thing of the entire Seder, and the strongest thing of the entire Pesach, Passover, is the matzah. Now, as I, I sort of casually mentioned before, and nowadays in Chicago, it's really easy, is eating handmade shmura matzah. Shmura means the wheat was guarded from when it was cut, from when it was harvested, so no water came in contact with it. That's what the word shmura means. And handmaids means we're saying a human being is doing the work, not a machine, which of course has a lot of impact because the matzah is supposed to be made with a certain intention, which is sort of hard for machines to have. So handmade shmura matzah, ideally 
the whole Pesach eat ham made from matzah. You cannot, for whatever reason, at least for the seders. It's a whole different level of an experience. And nowadays, I think in any kosher store, you can get it. And there's so many people that order special version. And when I first came to Chicago 30 some years ago, we went through a lot of effort to get those matzahs. Matzah is food. It's something we eat. It's something we digest. It's physical. And it's physically feeding us faith, belief in God, especially by the Seder and especially the first Seder. Actually, we're told the first Seder, matzah is the food of faith. And this is what it says Kabbalistically. The second Seder, matzah is the food of healing. So as you're eating that matzah the first night, be conscious. If you're going to forget everything else we say, be conscious you're eating belief in God. And if you get everything else, the second night, be conscious of healing. If you need a healing, that's what you should be thinking about. If, thank God, you don't need a healing, but there are other people in your life then do, think about them as you eat the matzah and really try to ask God that all this healing should go in that direction. We eat the matzah three times by the Seder. Eat the matzah as the midst of eating the matzah, which is still biblical. Maru is rabbinic. Matzah is still biblical. We eat the matzah a second time in our Hillel sandwich. And then when you're completely stuffed, you have your meal. Because after all that matzah, who has any room to eat anything? And then after the meal, when you really are stuffed, so eat wisely, you eat a matzah a third time. Of course, that matzah we call the Afi Kolmen, which has many reasons and significances and spiritualities we're not going to talk about. But I'm just going to say, bottom line, stay focused. The most spiritual of those three times is actually the third time. They're all spiritual. They're all holy. And the third time, when it's so purely for God, because you have so no desire to eat anything, be really focused. You are literally eating and digesting faith. Personally, though, on a regular week, I eat bread from Shabbos to Shabbos. Friday night, Shabbos day, Emla Malka, and that's it. I don't know. I think it's called a benching phobia. But on Pesach, I make a point every single day. Obviously, Yant, if you have no choice, but also Cholamoy, because here there's not too much Cholamoy, seemingly. I have matzah because I know I have an opportunity to eat faith in God, to strengthen my belief in God simply by eating. I'm going to go for it. The tradition is that we save from the matzah of the afikomen as the first food for a baby. So if there's any impending or current babies in your life that have not yet eaten, we save that afikom and matzah, we put it on the side, and when the baby is ready to eat at whatever, however old that baby is, crumble up the matzah in tiny, tiny, tiny crumbs and give it to the baby to swallow that the first food the Jew should eat is faith in God. And of the faith, of course, it's matzah. And of the matzah, it's matzah of the seder. And of the matzah of the seder, it's the matzah of afikom. If you put it aside, Remember where you put it. <laughs> you, know, you know, a few months later, it might be totally out of your brain. Why does matzah represent faith? For for more reasons than I have time to discuss. And I could, if I wanted to, spend this entire time on matzah, but I'm not going to because there's other things we're going to talk about as well. It re represents faith very simply because three million people chose to walk into a desert with just matzahs. Absolute trust that God would provide. And he did for 40 years. He gave us the month. The food of angels, the food that's going to be, we're told, the dessert by the Mashiach feast. But it all started off with that matzah. It represents faith because it's so simple. It's just flour and water, literally nothing else. Like our connection to God is simple. It's selfless. No benefits, reasons, conditions, which is what we've been discussing for the past two weeks. You can't make a fancy upgraded new wave matzah. Not for Pesach. No yeast, no sweeteners, no apple juice, no oil, no eggs, flour, and water. Like, just belief. In the Four Sons, which of course is another famous part of our Magid, are we telling the story, right? We have the wise, the wicked, the simple, and the one who doesn't even know how to ask. And usually the wise son is understood as the holy son, the righteous son, the godly son, the scholar, which is true. But of course... Everything the Seder is explained on so many levels. And another way of understanding the wise son is the intellectual. As you see from his question, his question actually doesn't sound like the firm, the righteous, the virtuous, the holy. It sounds like an intellectual question. So what's our answer to the intellect, to the intellectual afikomen? What do we tell him? Don't eat anything after the afikomen. Meaning, 
put aside your intellect. Leave in your mouth the taste of faith, of matzah. That's our response. And it also represents faith and freedom because the key to freedom and faith is humility, is nullification. Otherwise, we get so manipulated by subjective emotions and many other things. So matzah is flat, tasteless, egoless. It represents nullification, really our key to freedom. So again, if everything else you're going to forget, remember to eat matzah. Remember to eat matzah as much as you can over Pesach. And especially remember by the two sages to be focused. Ideally, as you're eating the matzah, I'm eating faith. I'm literally focused on absorbing and digesting a belief in God. And the second night as well, the overlay of I'm eating health. This is literally the food of healing. So actually, um, not going to the whole story, but now of course this is a tzaddik, so it's a little different, but still from the leftovers of the food from the Seder of the Alter Rebbe, of the first Rebbe of Chabad, the leftover food was given to a, a Hasidic doctor. Pretty unusual there were Hasidim at that time that were doctors, but a Hasidic doctor. And he would grind up whatever was left of the matzah, and I think maybe also mar and harosas, and he would use that as his medicine. Once there was a very, very critical case that none of the doctors could heal. And with this medicine, this Hasidic doctor healed this patient, and which had many ripple effects that later were like, wow, this tzaddik, this holy Jew whose leftover food is medicine of such potent effect, wow, which again, led to many other things that I'm not going to talk about now because that's not the point here. But just again, the power especially of that matzah. Okay, that's it. That's the matzah. Now I'm going to add other things. But if you're not going to remember anything else, remember the matzah. We said there are six items on the Seder plate. The zroya, the beitza, and the mur. That's the first triangle. So the zroya, of course, that roasted chicken neck or shank bone, is commemorating the Paschal lamb, the carbon Pesach. And that's why we don't eat it, because we don't eat a carbon Pesach nowadays. I mean, God willing, we should. God still has a few more days. We'll, we, we will be okay. Being in Jerusalem with the temple, we will be okay changing our Pesach plans. But at this moment, it's a Zroya on our Seder plate and we don't eat it. it. The truth is, if somebody likes it after the Seder, you are allowed to eat it. You do not have to put it in the garbage. But um, by the Seders, we do not eat it. And what is it showing us? It's showing us our roots. It's showing us the significance of remembering. We have it on the Seder plate to start, and we don't eat it. Everything else on the Seder plate, we eat at a certain point in the Seder. This is just like a memory. Remember your roots. Remember who we are. Remember who you belong to, what a people we come from. Because again, everything tonight is about freeing yourself. Every single thing in the Seder, one way or another, is to help us leave our personal Egypt. So one step in leaving our personal Egypt is remembering where you come from. Give us the determination, that inner strength to keep moving and get out. That's the zroya, the roasted chicken bone. The beitza, the hard-boiled egg. What's that? That we do eat. That's traditionally the first food of the meal. Meaning once you finish your hillel sandwich, the first thing we're supposed to eat is that hard-boiled egg from the Seder plate. Obviously, if you have a lot of people and one hard-boiled egg, you could add others. And usually the person who is his Seder plate eats that hard-boiled egg. But we eat it. It's the first part of our meal. And it represents a carbon. It represents the carbon hagiga, the festive carbon that was brought with the carbon Pesach. So that's what it is. That's why we eat it. But it also represents something. Egg has a lot of representation in Judaism. The strongest representation it has is the cycle of life. That's why, as you probably know, the first food given to a mourner after a burial is a hard-boiled egg because the egg represents, for a lot of reasons, that cycle. And it's sort of like we're focusing on now, meaning on one hand, Pesach is a very happy holiday. We're free. It's redemption. First day is Egypt. The last day is redemption, Geula, Mashiach. So it's very happy, positive energy. Same time in the state, of course, we're talking about what happened and the exile we were in and 210 very painful years. And of course, we're currently in an exile, which has lots of levels of pain. So like 
we're happy and we got out and we're happy we're going to get out and it was painful and it is painful. It's a lot of cycles of life going on and we're sort of pulling it all together in terms of both the pain and the joy and remembering and the hope and the confidence. And it's all like this egg, this cycle. And we know wherever it's holding, it's going to go. It's going to turn up. It's going to go to the ultimate redemption, to Mashiach. And the egg also has a symbolism, specifically a hard boiled egg, of something that has strength, something that started off soft. I mean, I have to unfortunately tell you that we had a whole case of eggs that were dropped accidentally. And there went a lot of those uh, car eggs. So eggs start off pretty soft. But then you boil them and they get tough. They get hard. And that's also a message in freedom. If you really want to walk to freedom, you can't stay soft. You have to put yourself through the fire. You have to get hard. You have to get a little tough. Because if we're too soft, in the end, we're going to want to be a sheep. We're going to want to conform to the status quo. It's very interesting. Lubavitcher have actually said many years ago that the challenge of our generation is being a sheep. You know, we just want to be safe and like everyone else. If everyone else is dying their hair neon green, we want to do that too. But we just want to be a sheep. And you can't go to freedom. So we really need that inner strength to, to take a stand for truth and not do what everyone else is doing. So that's the second item in the Seder plate, the egg. And then the base of that triangle, the base of that upside down triangle is the maror, the horseradish, the lettuce. Obviously the maror, the bitter herbs are reminding us of the harshness of slavery, but it's interesting reminder because a lot of times my kids will say, well, you know, this isn't such bad maror, lettuce tastes good. I mean, after the Seder, we eat it for salads a whole week, right? It tastes good. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not so bad. It's not so harsh, but if, so why in the world is that Marr, the, the horse brush, we understand. Now, there's a lot of different reasons given. But bottom line, there is something bitter in those in that lettuce. Say the stalk, some say the aftertaste, but the stalk itself, that white stalk is bitter, even if the leaves taste sweet or good. And that's sort of that duality that we're experiencing tonight of the stalk, so to speak, representing the bitter, the slavery, and the leaves, the sweeter taste, the freedom. You've got the stalk, you've got the leaves, you've got the bitter, you've got the sweet, you've got the slavery, you've got the freedom. And the message is we all will have challenges. That's one thing we know we will have. It's one thing you know your children will have. It's one thing you know your parents had and their parents and their parents. We all have that stalk to go through. When you're going through that stalk, when you're going through the challenges, no, it's to get to the leaves. Overcoming challenges is traditionally the road to get to that freedom. Now we're starting the next triangle where we have the charoises, the karpas, and again, mara. So we've got the charoises under the zroya, we have the karpas under the beitza, and then again, the base of that triangle is again, mara. And again, very similar symbolisms, because it's all about freedom, it's all about leaving our boundaries, so we have a lot of themes that keep resonating in many different ways. So the charoises also is very interesting if you ever took the time to think about it. What is a charoises? Well, it's supposed to represent slavery. It's supposed to be the color of the mortar and the texture of the mortar that they use for the bricks and the clay. Traditionally, people use apples, pears, dates, nuts, wine. Well, apples, pears, dates, nuts, and wine taste good. So Harosis represents the mortar, mortar, slavery, horrible slavery. It wasn't soft slavery. It was horrific slavery. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. They kept getting more and more intense in how they oppressed us. And Harris is sweet. And again, that's expressing that same theme. It's mortar. It's bricks. It's enslavement. The greater the challenge, Harris is sweet. The sweeter the freedom that comes from it. We're going through the bricks. We're going through the mortar. We all personally have our own bricks and mortar. Whatever they are, God designs it, tailor-made for each one of us. But we want to remember, and the Harris is sweet. The greater the challenge, the sweeter the freedom that comes from it. Parallel to that, on the other side of our triangle, is the karpas, the onion, the cooked potato, which we know is dipped toward the beginning of the meal of the seder. So we all sort of remember that one, right? It's dipped in the salt water. Salt water, a lot of symbolisms, most common one, tears. The tears of Egypt, the tears of all times, the back-breaking labor that evoked all those tears, all that pain which God specifically did as the prerequisite for freedom. 
those tears, that karpas represents everything we went through that helped us humble ourselves, humble ourselves to become God's people. And it's a very relevant message because we go through a lot of stuff in life that humbles us. <laughs> and we have a choice. We have a choice. And our choice is to just keep going your not so merry way and life will bash you. Probably life will bash you. Probably life will humble you. Probably as we go down that materialistic futility of life, we're going to get lots of bashes and blows. But there's another choice. There's the karpas. It's choosing real humility. It's choosing to humble ourselves before God, to choose to nullify ourselves. And it's almost like the Seder is saying, you have a choice. You can walk to freedom and walking to freedom means walking to humility, walking to being nullified before Hashem. That's like we said, that flat matzah, that's the karpas. Or not. I, I'm sure I don't have to ask. I'm sure we've all experienced plenty of blows in life. And we all understand what I mean, that life will do lots of things to bash you. But we have a choice. We could choose to humble ourselves. That was quickly going through those six items. And if it's too hard in your brain to hold all six, I totally relate. Pick one. Pick one of the six that actually like resonated in your heart or in your mind or in your soul. And remember that. Plus, of course, remember the matzo. And just keep it in mind, because again, sometimes you put so much in your mind and you just know I'm supposed to remember things and everything's spiritual and everything's powerful and I don't really remember things. Besides that, I'm tired. But try to pick something at least, because it just gives the Seder, the meaning is there if you know it or not. If you have no clue what's going on and you just say, God, I know there's a lot of meaning and please let all the meaning be materialized through me and in me and with me. That, that's a good message also. But when we remember, it's easier. I want to go through now three of the 15 steps of the Seder. We're only going to touch on three. We're going to touch on them briefly, but each one of these three I really felt was so relevant. And one thought from Angin. Yachatz. That's right in the beginning. Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz. Fourth step. Everybody's still fresh and awake and very focused. What do we do in Yachatz? Well, we break the middle matzah. We got three whole matzahs, as we discussed. We take out that middle one. Whoever has a Seder plate breaks the middle one. The smaller piece gets put back. The larger piece is actually broken into five pieces and put aside for the Afi Kaiman. It's a smaller piece that gets put back. It's a broken piece because, again, matzah is lechem only. It's poor man's bread. Poor man's bread is never whole. And then we, of course, have this hiding the matzah for the apikomen. There are different customs there. Some say the adults hide the matzah and the children find it to keep the children awake. In Svartik homes, they sometimes tie the apikomen under the arms of their children who carry it all night to commemorate when they left Egypt. Yeah, El, did they do that in your family by your traditional Siddhar? No, you didn't not do at that? all. Oh, do you, no. did, you know, did you have any friends that did that? Do you know? No, I've never heard of that. Never I know the Syrians, one. the Syrians wrap the matzah in like a napkin and put over like behind their, um, and they put yeah, like over their, like shoulder. their shoulder as a knapsack. Right. And then right. they, they have a whole spiel like, where are you going? I'm going right. to Israel. Where are you coming from? From Egypt. Why are you going? Because I'm leaving slavery, but... But that was not Moroccan. That, that was just Syrian. No, that's Syrian. No. Okay. So there are other Sephardim that actually literally, I always find that the Sephardic Minhagim are so picturesque. They literally, <laughs> again, the same idea of keeping the children engaged, but they're like tying it on the arms of their children that their children are going to spend the rest of the Seder with this matzah. Again, why? This is how we left Egypt. So the children are very involved. They have the most significant matzah. It's right under their arm. But whatever you do with your Afi Komen, and we in Chabad are very careful that the children shouldn't steal it because we don't want to teach children to steal, though we could hide it and they could find it, but we don't want any stealing going on. They're training in that direction. But the Yachatz really represents spiritually a very powerful message. The Yachatz means we're, there's something broken. We start off with the whole matzah and we broke it. And it's really expressing the brokenness in the world. And it's sort of like a question in our heart, like, God, you run this world. Why is there so much broken in the world? Why is there a world where hearts break, lives shatter, beauty crumbles, where we talk about things like Nashville and Texas and all those other tragic situations? What, why, why is that going on in your world, God? 
And the answer, because we're saying this is part of the say there. We're breaking a matzah here. It's part of how God is running currently in exile his world. Because the vessel, the vessel that's not broken contains its measure. But a broken vessel contains infinite. Matzah is a poor man's bread. It's low. It's broken. And that brokenness allows the soul to open up and allows us to escape our personal Egypt. Like, and I think we can understand this. As long as you're feeling like whole, there's no room to grow. There's a Hasidic expression. There's nothing more whole than a broken heart. When you're like whole and comfortable, you can be comfortable in a very godly way. You know, I'm a good person and I attend this class and I maybe attend other classes and I busy helping other people and raising my family. I'm a good person doing a lot of good things. There could be a certain like complacency that sets in. A certain maybe ego, maybe not ego, but just like a settledness of like comfort zone that is like the antithesis of growth. <laughs> so we, we don't want to be like uncomfortable, but we want to have a certain edge of our chairness to us that allows room to keep moving, to keep growing. And that's Yacha. Well, after that, we go, of course, go into Maga telling the story. And we know the more you tell, the better. And some families have every child going on and on. And some family says, anything you want to say, say for the meal. <laughs> but, so whatever your family does it, I'm going to give you one thought that I just thought was so relevant and powerful. Just one. You could share it. You can remember for yourself. It's on the words of Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah, which is towards the beginning of Magid, when these are the sages of B'nai Brak discussing the idea of remembering the Exodus. And when are we supposed to remember the Exodus? And Rebbe ben Azariah was saying, hey, I said, we have to remember the Exodus by day and by night. Everybody agreed by day, but I said by night. But you know what? No one listened to me. Until Ben Zoma came around and then Ben Zoma taught it and related it to a verse. And now we all agree we're supposed to also say it at night. But I was saying this for years and nobody listened to me. And Elizabeth Ben Azaria says, I ran Nika Ben Shimim Shana. I'm seven years old. I'm seven years old. And they're listening to me. That's so bizarre. That's so weird. Why is nobody listening to me when I'm already like an aged sage? Well, who was this for Elizabeth Ben Azaria? He was the Nasi. He was the head of the Sanhedrin at that time the head of the whole court of the 70 sages of the Jewish people. But he wasn't 70. As he said, like a 70-year-old, which means there was a whole backstory that I'm not going to go into, that there was a previous head of the Sanhedrin that was temporarily removed, and then they needed a new head, and they needed someone that would have a lot of merit to protect him in case this previous head would get upset at him. So the sages said, oh, Elizabeth Azariah. He's so righteous, he's so wise, he's so learned, and he has great yichos, that yichos will protect him, and he's wealthy, and he has all these protections. So he's the appropriate head of the Sanhedrin, that we got to just quickly put someone in. And they went to him and asked him, and he went home and asked his wife. He was 18 at the time. And his wife said, no way. You're going to be the head of the Sanhedrin? You're 18 years old. Nobody's going to respect you. No one's going to listen to you. Like, forget it. I don't want you to become a schmata trample. No way. All right. Go listen to your wife, right? He goes to sleep, and the next morning he wakes up, and there are 18 rows of white hair in his beard. So he and his wife understood that God was telling them something. They said, okay, he can become this head of the Sanhedrin. And for a while, it was just him. And then actually, the previous head they took back, so it was him and the other one. They alternated. And they amicably shared being the head of the Sanhedrin. But that's why he said, Hare Ani Ki Ven Shimim Shana. I'm like 70 because I, I look like an elder. I've got 18 rows of white in my beard, but I'm really 18. So with all that backstory, you're like, so what was he saying? He said, I'm like 70 and you guys weren't listening to me. Well, he wasn't 70. He was actually 18. He was only like 70. So why should anyone be listening to him? So there's a very interesting Kabbalistic explanation that really spiritually he was 70. Nothing in Judaism is just random. He happened to have these 18 rows. He happened to 
think he looked like 70. No, it's all very, very precise. And that's what he thought the law should be followed, as he was saying. Why was he like 70? Because he was a reincarnation of Shmuel Hanavi, of the prophet Samuel. Shmuel died when he was 52. And Elazar ben Azariah is 18. And 18 and 52 is 70. So spiritually, he really was 70. And that's why his opinion of the halacha should have been followed. And that's why he looked like he was 70, because Torah is mirroring this world. Why am I bringing this in? It's interesting. There's, there's, there's myriads of interesting ideas throughout the Seder, throughout the Magid. I'm bringing it in because I thought it was a very powerful lesson for us, as Lubavitcher Rebbe explains this concept. All of us are really, really, really old. All of us are far older than these 70 years that we're talking about here. Why? Well, Elizabeth Azari was 70 because he had 52 plus 18. He's 70. We have a lot more lifetimes than that. Generationally, as we actually were mentioning last week, two weeks ago, this generation was here building that tower of Babel, was here by the exodus from Egypt. We all experienced it. We forgot. We all experienced it. We all generationally were here by Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. We all came back now to bring Mashiach. And that's just generationally four times. And obviously, personally, we've come back many, many other times because we're told the soul has to come back until every single commandment we have done or studied. We have to come back to rectify anything our soul needs rectification in. We have to come back to achieve whatever the world needs from our soul's energy. So we all are old souls. We all have been here many, many, many times. Just like Rabbi Elizabeth and Azaria was like, I have a spiritual power of a 70-year-old. Even though you might not think on my biological clock, I am one. So ourselves as well. Every single one of us. Every single Jew in our generation. Like sometimes we are challenged by things we don't feel we have the strength to deal with. And we should remember this concept. We are super powerful. Every good thing each one of us did in every one of our previous lifetimes, I don't know if that means 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, everything we did in every one of our previous lifetimes is part of our current arsenal. Everything. We are very powerful. And you could say, well, what about everything bad I did in all my previous lifetimes? Then that, that could be impacting now as well, but it doesn't work that way. Good is very different than bad. Good is eternal. Evil is not. Evil is concealment. Probably whatever you did wrong in a previous lifetime, you repented for. If you didn't, you were cleansed, you were punished. It doesn't exist anymore. But your good lasts forever. And that could really answer the question. We could ask, how can we bring Mashiach if the previous generations that for sure, officially, for sure, no question, were much holier than us. They didn't bring Mashiach and we're going to bring Mashiach. But again, it's the same idea. We're more powerful than them because each one of us contains all the good we've done in all of our previous lifetimes, plus whatever we're adding now. So we have a lot of power. And I wanted to share this thought from every thought I could have brought from the Magid, because I think it's so important for us in our lives to always remember how powerful we are. And sometimes I'm sure, I'm sure it's not only me, that we feel we're in a situation where it's demanded much more than I possibly can do. I, I would ask and get feedback, except it's so late and I do want to go through two more of the steps, but I'm sure... Every one of us has had situations, because I definitely have had many, where I feel I cannot handle this. God is pushing me more than I have the strength for. I, I can't do this, God. This is bigger than me. And this is the thought to remember when we're in those situations. Each one of us has much more strength than we realize. Each one of us is very old. If you feel tired, now you know why. We're very, very old souls.
And sometimes in those same situations where we feel, whoa, this is challenging me. Whoa, this is bigger than I can handle. And then we handle it. And we do have the strength for it. And we do overcome it. And this could be why. When you pull, you will find that you do have a lot of strength. That you're very strong. Much stronger than you think. Just by raise a virtual hand, besides myself, who has experienced this many times. Someone else here, does this resonate with? Have you been in situations where you're like, no way. God, this is too big for me. Yep, right now. So I have gone through this many times. She is going through it this second. So Arit raised her virtual hand as well. And I assume you, Al and Miriam, agree. Because I don't think anyone's off the hook. If we're such powerful people, if we are such old souls, there's a reason. God doesn't waste energy. He gave all of us all this energy, and he is definitely giving us the situations that force us to use it. So whatever, if it was past, if it's present, God willing, it won't be future. Just remember, you are so strong. Every one of us with a strength we've accrued through lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of serving God. All right, I'm going to do this quickly, but I want to go quickly through two more steps to have something in your brain as you go through the Seder. And again, maybe I'll put on our group from last year. If you want to go through all 15 steps, this was just three. Benching, right? After the meal, we're going to jump from Magid, which is the fifth step, to Beirach, the 13th. Race after the meal, thanking God for the food. Right before we bench, we pour that cup of wine for Eliyahu our prophet Elijah, we fill our cup with wine. This is our third cup. You can get low alcohol content wine. We say that benching, bless the wine, drink the wine, and the O's cup stays till the end of the meal, then pour it back in the bottle. I want us to think about this just for like a second because we bench many times besides once or twice a year. And the theme of benching, which is by the Seder big time, and by every single time we say that grace after the meal, every time we bench. The theme of benching is confidence. Confidence, there's a higher force within our daily lives. We say it loudly, we are supposed to bench out loud. We're supposed to bench every time, and the Seder especially, loudly, with joy, with sincerity. We are initiating here a reciprocal current, meaning miracles happen when divine energy from beyond enters within. Why did all those miracles happen in Egypt? Because we believed they would. Those who didn't believe saw a lot of plagues. To see the miracles, people open their hearts and minds enough to receive infinity. And when we're benching loudly, with joy, with confidence, with trusting God, that's the opening we make we're thanking God here for a miracle, for the miracle of food, as Yael started us off an hour ago. Thank God we have the money. Thank God there's the food to buy. Thank God we have the strength and ability to make it and serve it and eat it. So we're thanking God for the miracle of our food. As we bench, we're opening up to initiate that reciprocal current for many, many other miracles. That's benching by the Seder, especially and really every single time we bench. And the last step we're going to talk about is... Step 14, challah, praising God. That's the second to last one. The last one is near the end. That's a one-liner. So challah, praising God, is just a beautiful step. And a lot of times people are tired. It's the end. You race through it. I want you to know what you're doing as you race through those words. You fill up the cup with wine. This is cup number four. And then we open the door to welcome Elio Hanavi, the prophet Elijah. Children go. You can go. You can stay seated. You can go. And we recite Shvach Hamascha, pour out your wrath on those nations that have been oppressing us. I want to highlight this point. It's an incredibly significant time. Literally, Eliyahu comes to your Seder. We are told that literally Eliyahu Navi comes to every single circumcision, every bris milah, and he comes to the door of every single Seder. It's not a joke. It's not cute. It's not only another technique to keep the children up. It's a reality. The fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe told his son, who would become the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, 
before the door was opened, ask wisely. Don't waste the opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity to ask. So if you're standing by the door or if you're sitting by your place, it doesn't make a difference. You can do whichever is your best comfort zone in this situation. Ask wisely. Understand Elia who is there. Understand it's an opportunity to ask. And take those minutes and think of what is the most important thing you want to ask for and ask wisely. The Seder, the first night especially, is called Leil Shimurim, a night of protection. Hashem is guarding us. And that's one of the reasons we open the door. We're opening up with confidence. We're opening up with trust. The first Pesach, we were liberated because of our trust. And also now we will be liberated. We're having Mashiach, we're having redemption, and we have trust. And that trust is making it happen. And that opening the door represents all that. And then we offer praise to God for his mercy, for his compassion in redeeming us in anticipation of the ultimate redemption. We're actually told all of this hallel is much more about the future than the past. That's why we say less about it because we know less about it. But we are really saying hallel for Mashiach that's coming now. You could just wonder, why does God need my praise? Like, he's God. <laughs> And the answer is he doesn't. God doesn't need my praise. I need to praise him. And Kabbalistically, we're told when we praise God's kindness, we reveal his compassion. And what we're, the message we're giving God here, and it's such a powerful message, and that's what I want to end with this point, is we spent a whole say there. It's a while. There's a lot of steps. We're on step 14. We did a lot of things, everything in our power to achieve Pesach, to achieve freedom, to get out of our Egypt. Every ritualized step of the Seder, every item of the Seder, it's all about achieving freedom. And now we're saying Hallel. And when we're saying Hallel, the message is, God, I'm surrendering. I, I'm putting myself in your hands. I'm surrendering that you complete whatever I couldn't do on my own. There's a lot of details to the Pesach say there. And a person could feel like, I don't even know if I'm going to do it all right. And I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing to do it all right. And there's a lot going on and it's difficult and it's challenging. And maybe I messed up on some of the steps. God, I'm surrendering. Please, whatever I didn't manage to achieve, whatever I didn't achieve in this process of freedom, Please complete whatever I couldn't do. Please carry me the rest of the way. And I think if you envision your say there, you're trying so hard. You're doing everything so focused. And at the end, you're saying to God, I tried. Please finish it off. Carry me the rest of the way. I think that gives us a feeling of like, okay, we're not going to get concerned and stressed. We know God's taking care of us. We know God's actually carrying us. And again, whatever God tells us to do, he does. He told us to open our door. Again, very significant because tonight he is opening every door. The night of the Seder, both nights of the Seder. He's opening every door in all the cosmos. He's opening all the doors for the Jewish people. For each one of us, regardless of what we've done for the past year, the night of the Seder is the chance to jump, right? Pesach is from the word of leaping over, like God leaped over the doorposts. So we're leaping with all those open doors, through those open doors, to reach the highest spiritual levels. We can do Pesach. We can leap. God is doing it, so we can do it as well. So I hope we should all have a lot of liberation, a lot of freedom, a lot of Pesach. I hope you